Mr. Commissioner, I'd like to go back to Afghanistan's economy, which, as you mentioned, prior to the Taliban takeover, was heavily dependent on foreign aid. Donor funds accounted for about three quarters of the country's revenue. And now, with the Taliban in charge, much of that uh, monetary flow has dried up. And in addition, the United States has frozen billions of dollars in Afghan reserves that are held in New York banks, exacerbating the economic crisis. Do you believe, as many U.S. lawmakers and diplomats have urged, that the United States and other nations need to be more flexible in providing financial assistance, despite the sanctions that you referenced earlier? Um, and how can they do that without, uh, without uh, running foul of many of these laws that have been in place since uh, 2001? Of course, I believe that flexibility is a must in a situation like that. We're talking about millions of human lives. We're also talking about, frankly, the stability of a region that is beset by many problems. Let's not forget that the, the Taliban themselves, after they took over, have had to face their own insurgency from other uh, uh, armed groups. And uh, of course, further impoverishment of the country will constitute, will create fertile ground for new uh, terrorism and new insurgencies, which have a ter terrible uh, potential to destabilize the region. That's why Pakistan, Iran, Central Asian states are so worried about that. So I think it's important whilst the pressure is kept on the key issues that we all care for, rights of women, rights of minorities, I've mentioned this many times already, we need to keep that pressure, but we also need to make sure that services function, that Afghans that are sick can go to hospital, that the pitiful COVID vaccination rates, I think less than 10% at the moment, uh, uh, are, are, are increased. Uh, that, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about uh, girls in schools, but if 70% of the teachers are not paid, nobody can go to school. So I think all this needs to be looked at with a great deal of balance and flexibility. The question will also be how to do that. I understand that, you know, I understand this is a political issue, but uh, donor countries are reluctant to channel their funds through the Taliban authorities. They were channeled through the Afghan government before, and now they're reluctant to do that, and, and at least and until certain things are fulfilled by the Taliban. And we are exploring in the UN many alternative systems to make sure that uh, uh, services function, like paying salaries through UN agencies, for example. Now, all of this uh, is very technical, is far beyond my remit, but is important. But in the end, in the end, it, it is important to maintain that dialogue with the Taliban because all these systems will be temporary in nature. And how to ensure that Afghanistan is viable, is a viable country able to support its people, I think will, will only be achieved through dialogue between the international community and the Taliban themselves. But dialogue won't be easy. We can look at interim measures to make it function, but in the end, that dialogue is important. And the dialogue goes both ways. When I was in, 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 in Kabul and when my colleagues were there, we all told the Taliban the same message. If you want your, your resources to be unfrozen, if you want the country to enjoy again substantive development, support by the international community, you also have to make steps in, in, in their direction. It's, it goes both ways, but it is a dialogue. It cannot be a wall-to-wall -wall situation. 